All right, thank you for joining us for the Chicago Wilderness Cafe, Growing Through Change. I wanna welcome Isa Redlinski from the Field Museum and Patty Vitt from Lake County Forest Preserves. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes. Please keep yourself on mute so that we can hear our presenters. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat. All right. Well, thank you so much, Laura, and welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, being here with us, especially that we know it's spring break for many of you. Maybe some are out burning. Uh, but today we wanted to talk to you about uh, how to source seed in a way that is climate adapted and why it's important and what is some of the uh, ways that people have described doing it and then um, what can we do as a region here to uh, move in a climate adapted way in restoration. So then I will be able to proceed with my slides. Let's see. Okay, so uh, we are a group of uh, individuals from many different institutions, large and small, uh, nonprofits and cultural institutions, regional and national ones. And uh, our group is, that is looking into it is a group of academics, current and previous land managers. And we're working at this issue of how to ensure that our restorations are climate adapted from different angles. Um, and uh, this, uh, we started working together uh, probably late spring of last year. And our first large event was on September 15th, uh, previous year, where for three and a half hours, over 100 individuals sat with us through presentations, discussions, and um, a breakout groups discussing uh, how people source seed, whether we think there's uh, any gaps in how we source it, what are some of the concerns, what do we consider, are there policies different organizations have. And from that, we figured out, um, and also we have a synopsis of all the notes happening that someone is putting in the chat probably right now. And uh, we have figured out that our group of people um, working on it would like to or, uh, sort of prioritize our areas um, with finding guidelines for regional seed sourcing, especially for our Chicago wilderness region. And the first step to do it would be a review of existing literature. And Patty will go into some more details of things uh, that are interesting that we found so far. Uh, but what I want to do today is uh, sort of walk with everyone through different uh, seed sourcing strategies or seed provenancing strategies. Uh, explain what they are and uh, what are some of the pros and cons to using them and when uh, land managers as well as scientists and, and acad academics that figure out is the best way of using it. So each one of my slides will have this pretty a slide on top as you can see here. And that slide has, you can see there's a sort of a position of colors from blue into the orange and those colors um, uh, show or indicate environmental gradients in the direction of climate change. Um, then the dark circled um, point uh, on the slide is that here has a pie chart in it, is the uh, place of the project that's being restored and the dotted circles or the smaller circles as you can see throughout that uh, spread of colors are where the seed is sourced from. And then the pie chart in the middle of that is actually representative of those circles that you see that are dotted circles. So each one of the strategies will sort of have a figure associated with it. I just wanted to explain what those figures mean um, as we proceed. So our uh, first um, type of seed provenancing strategy is local, strict local sourcing. And this is how a lot of our um, seeding started or seed collecting and uh, spreading started in this region about 40 years ago when we started doing restorations. And strict local approach is sourcing from the site where the project is taking place and potentially maybe adding some um, sites all around in close proximity that allow for a normal gene flow. So, you know, if you're in Cook County Forest Preserves and might be sourcing from one um, spot and across the street that uh, 100 years ago or so were one large system. And there's a lot of advantages to that. 
um, especially back in the day, and that's why people used to do this as a main type of seed sourcing strategy, is that we know that this seed is very much adapted to the area where it is uh, growing. It's adapted to its climate, but also to all these other environmental conditions like soil types and moisture levels, etc. Some of the disadvantages to that approach uh, is that it, uh, it might have a very narrow genetic base. And in turn, that can lead into inbreeding. So inbreeding uh, is when um, organisms with similar uh, genetic uh, diversity, continue breeding together, and that may lead to uh, reduce, reduce gen, uh, genetic diversity, which leads to reduced fitness. Um, so they might have smaller populations, less seeds uh, that are being produced, etc. Having that narrow genetic base can also lead to genetic thrift and lack of a, uh, adaptive potential. And this can be the case when uh, climate is changing and perhaps the environmental conditions are changing, not just temperature and, um, and precipitation, but how moist the area will be. Maybe the area is transitioning from a sedimental to wet prairie, et cetera. So as you can see on the graphic here, sourcing only within that site or in close proximity to it. Um, and this is best used when disturbance is minimal. We have large populations that are present. So uh, if you're looking at a given species, you have many individuals growing throughout that site. Uh, and then you have a predicted distribution for the species, um, predicted distribution change for that species under climate change is also low. And Patty will address that more uh, because different species do have different distribution changes that are predicted. Uh, and we'll learn more about that from Patty in just a minute. Our next um, sourcing strategy is the regional or local relaxed version, which is also something that's been used in our area for the last 40 years or so uh, as restorations have started. So that is um, seed sourcing that uh, sources from a close proximity with an emphasis on matching environmental conditions from donor to recipient sun. So it's not only that you're closing fairly near, but if you're restoring a sand prairie, you're collecting species from another sand prairie to match that. Um, so there's advantages to this. Uh, you know, you will have a very small risk of maladaption because you're collecting from nearby uh, and you're collecting from similar environmental conditions. But because you are expanding your uh, reach of seed sourcing, you will avoid inbreeding and you will increase adaptive potential of that site. Some of the disadvantages might be that you still might be dealing with a pretty narrow genetic base. And uh, due to that, you, you might be lacking adaptive potential when climate is changing. So uh, that regional seed sourcing is good to use again, when disturbance is minimal and you have uh, that distribution change for a given species is low. And what we will find out again from Patty is that within the same plant community, you might have species that have a low distribution, predictive distribution change and some that might shift their distribution altogether. So um, this makes it trickier because as we're sourcing seed, uh, you might have to have different strategies for different species. Our next one is the composite uh, seed sourcing strategy. So that means that you are um, sourcing from areas that are close by, but also a little further away. And the environmental conditions, you're trying to uh, match the environmental conditions of donor and recipient site, but you're aware that as you're uh, moving further away from your source site, that might be less possible. And I really like this graphic here, and the graphics are um, adapted from a Bukharova paper that were made by uh, Jessa Finch, uh, who's part of our group. I like this graphic here because it shows that you are collecting from nearby, but you're also collecting from further away. And the species, the, the points that are collected from further away might be smaller in the amount of seed collected, but they're still important, and they're incorporated into that color wheel, the pie chart of, um, 
of what, of what you're uh, bringing into the site. And the advantages of that is that you will be avoiding and breeding depressions because you have such a broad genetic diversity that you're bringing in and you're, through that your adaptive potential is increasing. However, because you're projecting for the future, perhaps some of those species uh, that, that seed brought in from further away might be maladapted right now. It might be adapted only under future conditions. And there also is a small chance of outbreeding depression where um, the different genetic diversity of a given plant species is so different between two sites that their offspring uh, will also have decreased thickness. And the recommendation that you use for this is again, when disturbance is minimal, fragmentation is high, and then the predicted distribution change for different species is, is moderate. Uh, our next approach is the admixture. And admixture is a type of a seed sourcing when you're sourcing from many populations from different distances throughout the range of the species. So usually when we're sourcing for Chicago wilderness region where, uh, and we want to source in a climate adapted way, we're sourcing a little south or southwest. This would mean that you're also maybe looking at some sort of seed sources regionally south and southwest, but perhaps throughout the whole range. So maybe even looking into Wisconsin or other areas. And the advantage, because you have such a broad genetic diversity that you're bringing in, is that you have a high or highest adaptive potential. But there's a good potential that you might have maladaption, at least in the short run. So some of those plants might not, uh, some of that seed might not have the highest thickness under current conditions. It might lead to outbreeding depression. And there are some instances when uh, a genotype or epitype brought from further away becomes particularly invasive at a new site. So that is also a possibility uh, that we should consider as we're making these choices. So um, admixture seed sourcing uh, should be used when uh, disturbance is high and also the predicted distribution uh, change of the species in question is high. We also have predictive seed sourcing. So as you can see from that graph or from the figure, uh, you are projecting for future conditions and you're sourcing seeds uh, from areas where the project, where the, currently they have the climate that is projected for the site in question. That is why the, um, the um, source of the seed is in orange and then your project site is also in orange on the graphic. An advantage to that is that you will be very well adapted for future conditions, but if the climate change predictions are correct. So uh, we know our climate change condition uh, projections are correct on the short term, but then there's more um, variance as we go further into the future. And some of the disadvantages are just like before, you might have a, a, a chance for maladaption. Uh, there's a potential that uh, the genotype will become invasive. And this is why research is really needed um, to sort of, um, be, so we're able to um, optimize between the risks and the benefits of, of doing that type of uh, adaptation. And it's best to use when you have a high confidence in future predictions. So usually looking at 10, 20 years ahead, uh, you're dealing with a long-lived species. So you know this might not be the best approach for your annuals, biannuals, or short-lived perennials. This is the strategy that people will use with trees. And testing, uh, the approach has had some research and has been tested in natural areas, not just in the lab setting. And finally, our final seed sourcing strategy is being uh, climate adjusted. So uh, climate adjusted is sourcing from areas adapted to future conditions based on models and transplant experiments. And I uh, really want to stretch that, that sorry, you see the past, that it, it talks about being based on models and uh, transplant experiments. An advantage of that is, again, you will have a very highly adapted conditions, but only if your projections are correct. And uh, there's a great potential for uh, wrong predictions and requires a lot of research, which 
you know, takes time, is expensive. Um, so use this when uh, you're, you're pretty confident about future conditions and then the predicted distribution range is very high and also well understood. So I know we just threw a whole bunch of different models for you and you're probably thinking, well, how, how do they come together? Uh, what is best? What should I do at my site? Which is always my, my questions, like what is best for the project I'm involved in? So if you look at this uh, graph right here that has been adopted from the Bukharova 2019 paper, you have your adaptive potential on the y, uh, y axis, so your genetic uh, diversity here. And then you have your local adaption, so evolutionary fit for that very spot on the x axis. And ideally, we want to be in the upper right hand corner, but there isn't a, uh, a model for that. So, um, knowing what your project is, what the goals of your project are. Uh, how does funding look for future as well as uh, currently what your policies are. You have the tools to make the decisions of what is best for you. Perhaps the goal of your project is to preserve the local genotype of a, uh, I don't know, remnant prairie or a dunes whale ecosystem. And then you are using that local seed sourcing strategy. Um, so, so this is a, I really like this graphic and I really want to thank uh, Jenna for uh, sort of making it uh, very visually appealing. So that will conclude sort of our end of um, introduction to different types of uh, seed sourcing strategies. And we want to ask you a few questions. So Laura will uh, install, uh, we'll start a polling question. We want to know who you are. Uh, please tell us about yourself. Are you a researcher, a land manager, steward, an interested person? Is your uh, interested in this? Or if it's something else, put it in the chat. We'll, we'll get the chat afterwards. And um, as uh, we're answering the polling questions, I'm going to stop sharing and we can open this to uh, questions and answers. So uh, please put some questions in the chat. Uh, so we can answer those for you. Uh, we also have other members of our group. So you're not just relying on me, but you're relying on many other experts in this field. So thus far, I don't see um, actually any questions, um, but if you have thoughts, if you've tried any of these approaches and they've worked for you or they haven't worked for you, um, we'd love to have you um, drop those kinds of comments into the chat as well. So there's one question from Derek, um, who would like you to speak more about outbreeding depression, if you would, please. And uh, anyone else from our group, please hop in. I am by no means a genesis uh, here, but um, I think what can happen, my understanding is that when uh, some, when, when you're in, say, restoring a prairie and you're bringing a species that's quite specific to a given um, area and doesn't have a large uh, range of distribution, then that can lead if you uh, have seed that's very well adapted to one area and maybe um, that species is a species that uh, doesn't undergo sexual reproduction but selves. Uh, so uh, the gene exchange is, is small and then you're bringing in um, seed from the same species but maybe 300 miles away where uh, Maybe it's black deep soil prairie versus a sand prairie. The conditions are different when those two sexually reproduce and make the next generation. That offspring might be not as well adapted um, into that new area and might have lower fitness. So meaning um, we'll have a smaller seed set. Maybe that seed will not be germinating as well, et cetera. And that could be caused by outbreeding depression, which is opposite from inbreeding depression, if, if, which is if you have um, 
genetic material from the site, same site exchanging um, and uh, sort of uh, you have those rare genes and alleles eliminated through that inbreeding process. Did I get that right? My, my last genetics class was a long time ago. Uh, but thank you for the question, Bear. Yeah, that, that, that seemed to answer it well. Um, I was kind of paying attention to uh, some other things, but what I caught, um, I think it answered it pretty well. Um, and we have one other person has made a comment. Kathy says that landscapers increasingly seem to be introducing foreign species to gardens. It's hard to find indigenous trees, shrubs, and plants for the home landscape. And yeah, I think that that's, um, if you go to a lot of the commercial uh, retail outfits for uh, native, uh, for landscaping, your landscaping needs, I think that's true. Um, a lot of the forest preserves and other conservation groups, more and more are having native plant sales. Um, uh, like, for example, I know that uh, uh, Citizens for Conservation has a, uh, an ongoing plant, uh, native plant sale right now. Um, the Lake County Forest Preserve District um, sells native trees and shrubs in October during their October uh, event. So they are available, but they're not, you have to, you do have to search a little bit for them. And um, the IllinoisPlants.org native plant sales link has been brought up. So that's one stop shopping that makes it really easy to um, find some of those, um, some of those resources in one place. And I've stopped the, um, I've stopped the polling and I'm sharing the results now with you. Um, it looks like just a small group portion of our group would consider themselves researchers. And by far, uh, almost 60% of the people who have responded uh, consider themselves to be just interested persons, which is, which is awesome. Um, we do have some land managers and site stores here as well. Um, so thanks for that. That helps us kind of understand um, some things. And then um, we have uh, another, how do you feel about predictive composite or admixture strategy? So why don't we hold that a little bit towards the end? Um, if you wanna chat amongst yourselves, that's great. Um, I'm going to continue the formal part of the presentation. Um, first by thanking all of our sponsors and um, our institutions who are sponsoring us to help share this uh, with you. Um, and then also um, just wanna walk through a little bit of what our group has been working on and what we found so far and kind of share some of those, a, a finer, uh, more finely tuned way of looking at climate adapted seed sourcing in particular. So we have conducted um, a series of uh, searches and web of science um, using combinations of keywords that include seed sourcing, restoration, climate change, just to try and get an idea of the literature that's out there. Um, and we got, you know, sort of this enormous response of, you know, over 2000 unique titles. But what we realized through doing it through these multiple searches is that um, there were some papers that just kept showing up. Um, and there, you know, there was at least one paper that showed up in all nine of the searches. Um, and it turned out that you know, a small proportion, 120, uh, showed up in three or more of our word combinations. And so just to get an idea of what those papers were talking about, what they were addressing, um, we reviewed the abstracts and tried to pull out some of the key aspects, um, things like the geographic region where the study was focused, um, what type of focal species they were reporting on, whether it was an experiment or perhaps a review article. Um, and 
what we found of those 120, really only 78 of them specifically addressed um, the provenance of native plant materials. Um, and by provenance, we basically mean it's a study that was um, set up so that they were looking at the performance of different uh, seed, different sources of seed. Um, and most of them were really focused on woody or tree species that have a strong economic value. Um, and there was a really strong trend for studies that were done either in North America or Europe. Um, we found a real lack of representation for the types of herbaceous species that we use for the most part in our restoration. Um, and so what we are kind of now doing is um, really trying to focus on synthesizing overall what the results of these, all of these studies will tell us um, to see if there's any commonality. Is there a geographic distance or an elevational distance that can you know, tell us something about where we should be sourcing for climate change here in the Midwest? And what we did find though, was that there's one paper that we all really agreed um, kind of, even if we don't have the kind of provenance trials that they are doing for trees, um, we might actually consider this as a roadmap for how we would um, try and source ourselves locally and regionally. And it's this paper here. Um, it's a climate oriented approach uh, to support decision-making for seed provenance and restoration. Um, and it is, it does just a great job of uh, laying out a framework for, you know, making some of these decisions. Thank you, Honor. She's dropped the link into the chat so you can all have access to this paper. Um, and it does advocate kind of a mixed approach, as Isa said, that could be based on life history characteristics and other uh, things about the species, but especially the range that a species um, has is also really important. Um, and then it really also takes advantage of user-friendly web-based GIS resources to help even the, you know, the uninitiated do some modeling and some exploration of how ranges might shift as a result of climate change. So I, I just want to spend a little bit talking about how these models work uh, so that you just have a general background. Um, and basically, you know, we all know that species kind of um, have a greater or lesser type of uh, fidelity to a site or a region. They might like a particular rainfall pattern or temperature. Um, and we call that the niche space that is occupied by that species. And what these models do is basically um, take the geographic coordinates of any particular species, where they're located, and then layer on top of those, these other kinds of two-dimensional uh, maps, if you will, of environmental um, variables. And it could be soil type, it could be um, uh, topography, it could be elevation. There are lots of different things that species um, respond to. Uh, and we can take, you know, almost anything your imagination tells you a species uh, likes or dislikes, we can use those environmental variables in some of these models. And then what the model approach does is to take all of these layers kind of together and then um, map a probability of where the species should occur given all of these things. And so for as a kind of quick example, um, if you're looking at something like bog rosemary, which tells you it likes only bogs, um, you know, you, you map the entire environmental layer, but you're only gonna get a hit for this species in a bog where it's known to occur or a bog where maybe they haven't seen it, but it has the same, maybe, uh, you know, pH signature. And so you might go and look for it there and find it if, 
if it exists there. And when people do this kind of modeling and then do the kind of ground truthing, they actually get pretty good fit. So they, we know that these models work in current time and space. Um, the, this is basically its projected distribution. And so I, I just kind of described one species um, and then a kind of process where you do this and then you do some ground truthing. And there have been several studies that have really shown that um, these models are very good at predicting current locations that are unknown. And then you can go out and you can search for them and you find the species. And so the, the modeling approach has been well tested um, and it seems to work really well. So one of the difficulties for many species is the location data itself um, because it, 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 they really rely on the known location where the species are. Um, so, but I just wanna walk you through um, one type of one, of one attempt at this type of modeling um, to not only look at where the species is currently, but to show how you can take this modeling approach um, and using different climate scenarios model into the future, what the distribution of a species might look like. So this is um, prairie bush clover. Uh, which is a fairly rare species. It's pretty much confined to um, th this four state region in the Midwest. Uh, it likes gravel hill prairies. Uh, and I did this model primarily looking at climate uh, variables only. And one of the things that I'd like to point out is that this is, this is its this is this was its known distribution um, that I had access to in 2000. And you'll see that there's this red, nice warm area up in this part of Wisconsin um, and also over here. And there actually are um, populations of the species that I didn't know about when I did this model. And so there's yet another indication that um, the modeling approach will tell us where things are now. And hopefully then if we're trying to use it to project into the future, then the, um, the uncertainty in those future models isn't the modeling approach, it's the climate layers. One thing that I wanna point out is that there's this really bright red kind of warm area that congregates where we know there's a lot of the species. And this is pretty much kind of the, the central portion of the species distribution as we know it currently. So I just wanna do one step into the future, 2020. Um, and again, one of the things that I think is really interesting, you can see the Illinois populations are beginning to be outside of the area where it's predicted with high probability to occur. So it's getting a little cooler down there, um, it, while at least according to the model, if not in reality. But one of the interesting things is that it actually is a result of cooling that we're seeing this pattern. Um, so these, individual populations, um, if you look at them, uh, they're predicted to have really cold and wet springs. And so uh, that's, again, this model's 10 years old. So in 2020, when we made this prediction about uh, these populations being outside of their preferred climate area, um, it was kind of, that was, a, that was a real, wait a minute, it's, it's global warming, right? Um, why are these springs predicted to be cold and wet? Um, but as we moved into 2020, that's precisely what happened. And the seed germination fell off and the populations are, you know, sort of um, having a little bit of vulner more vulnerability as a result of that. Um, and so this also suggests that as we do our climate modeling and as the climate models themselves are refined, the closer the scenario is projected, the more likely it is to have a, a good understanding of what's likely to happen. So, you know, from 2020, from 2010 to 2020, it looks like the climate models pretty much done the, a good prediction. Um, and then 
from 2020 to 2050, it looks like our populations in Illinois of this species are likely to be outside of what we call their climate envelope altogether. Um, and then if we jump ahead to 2080, we kind of see the same thing, uh, even more so um, than that. But overall, it looks like the climate envelope, the climate that this species really thrives under um, is moving kind of to the north and west. And what I've done here is to show um, using this uh, big dot here, this is the centroid of the distribution of the preferred climate of this species in 2000. And this up here is the centroid of the preferred distribution under this climate change prediction um, for this species in 2080. And so then this arrow is an indication of the direction and magnitude of the predicted change in the climate envelope for this species from 2000 to 2080. So this is just one species, um, one set of climate predictions. Um, and while informative, it doesn't necessarily tell us a whole lot uh, about some of our other species because the distribution is so small. Um, and the overall, the types of changes that can happen in a species range um, can have kind of different types of shifts in different portions of the range. So a species can experience an expansion of the range shown right here, um, or it can have a contraction of parts of the range shown here. Some portions of the range may not change at all. In the case of um, the Lespedeza that we were looking at, the prairie bush clover, it was pretty much, you know, a full on range contraction, except in the northernmost portion of the range itself. So let's look at a few more species and maybe see if we can find some patterns for these species. Now, again, these are rare species um, because we know the location data pretty well. Um, and we were curious how climate might affect these individual species. Um, and one of the things that I think is really fascinating about this particular uh, diagram, this is from Havens et al. in 2015, uh, sourcing for uh, climate, climate change, seed sourcing for climate change, um, is that we see really different patterns in the Western United States versus the Eastern United States. Um, and again, the setup is the same in these blocks right here. You can see that there's a central portion. Um, here's the, the beginning portion of where the climate is good in the in 20, 20, uh, 2000, sorry. And then here's where it's predicted to end up in 2080. So it's exactly the same setup. Um, and then what we've done here is just to put all the centroids into the origin of this, uh, of this diagram. And basically what you can see is that there's no pattern in terms of how these species are going to move. And it's really a result of the fact that the topography in the West is just um, pretty complex. There's lots of you know, ranges that don't change over a very large geographic distance. What they're doing is they're moving up elevation. Um, and, and that's kind of reflected here, but there's also just no overall pattern. In the Eastern species, we do see pretty much a pattern. We see um, a change uh, from, you know, where species are likely to move or their climate envelope rather is moving sort of to the North and East by and large. That's where most of them seem to be moving. And so, I, I just, and that's just because, um, you know, we don't have the, the large changes in topography to deal with. And so for me, um, this is an indication that our seed sourcing uh, may be a little bit more straightforward. And so, you know, I, I'm kind of looking, this is, this is where I want to source seeds for, too. And so if I were thinking about long-term climate changes, and I'm kind of looking at some of these arrows here, because this is where I want to go, does this tell me, 
do these two arrows here, does that kind of tell me a general direction of where I might start to think about sourcing seeds? So what I've done is to um, look at some of the more widespread species and try and do some similar explorations to try and see how they might respond to climate change. Um, so this species is certainly one that most of us are using in restoration um, and um, it is really uh, pretty widespread. And if we do a current model of this particular species, um, we can see that it pretty much has this broad distribution and its climate sort of shows it's, it is, it's, its climate envelope is huge. Um, and there may be some areas, you know, sort of in the lower Atlantic species, Atlantic states where it might not be, um, and I might not be currently found. But again, there's a lot of populations that are known in this portion of the Northeast. And so that's why it's got such a bright red signature. And so from my perspective, this is great. I, I can kind of see it, it's a pretty good model for the current climate again. Um, if we do the whole range of the species and it's going to change into 2050, what does that look like? Um, and it looks like pretty much there's no change, um, but that's across the whole species range. It doesn't really tell me what I wanna know, which is kind of this area right here. Um, if I wanna source seeds for the Chicago wilderness area, um, this doesn't really get me where I want to go. Because maybe it just means that there is no change and I don't need to worry about it for this species, or maybe I'm just looking at it at the wrong uh, scale. And scale really does matter. So if you look at a, a more finely, uh, finer scale distribution map of this species, you can see that it basically is found in every county in Illinois. But as you move further south, it's not found in a lot of places. Um, and so this kind of both complicates my sourcing decisions, but it also complicates the modeling decisions um, because, um, you know, again, this is really where I want to source for. Um, and so maybe when I'm doing the modeling itself, I really need to just focus on, you know, a smaller range of this, or a portion of the range of the species instead of the whole range across uh, it, where it naturally occurs. And so that's kind of what I've done here. Um, I took some, took a random subsample of um, the distribution points of this species and um, mapped that instead, but kind of concentrating more in th this area because you know some of the previous models said that maybe Missouri is where we want to source from. And so um, just kind of trying to see how this works just as an exploration. And I do want to point out that these models here are using an online tool called LifeMapper, um, which pretty much anybody can use if you um, are interested in how a species might respond to climate change. You can go to LifeMapper and play around with it yourself. So. If Missouri is where I want to source from, and this is what it's cur that current distribution looks like, this is what the future distribution in 2020 would look like. And it does kind of look like there's a shift from you know, this sort of Missouri area up into uh, no northern, uh, our northern portions or our, um, our portion of the Chicago wilderness. So just so you can see side by side, that Missouri, roughly south and west, does appear to be a good climate match for the Chicago wilderness region in uh, 2050. Um, so if we were going to actually try and use this to make a sourcing decision, um, we could say that the climate models overall indicate a range expansion for this species rather than an outright shift. Um, and since our restoration location falls within both the current and the historic uh, extent, as well as the projected range under climate change, um, that, that tells us something about how we should be sourcing. 
We also know that it's widespread, it's wind pollinated, and local seed might actually be just fine. Um, but we might consider that we want, want to use some seed from Missouri as well. And so we might consider a composite provenancing strategy where we mix the sources to both increase the genetic diversity as well as potential for um, adaptation to climate change as it begins to occur uh, over, well, it is, uh, already is occurring. Um, so let's look at another species though, uh, one that has maybe a little bit smaller range, also is very widespread in restoration projects, um, but also has a different pollination strategy. And so I've done the same thing here. I've kind of, I've just jumped one step. I'm, I'm really looking just at mostly the Missouri area to see um, whether Missouri is a good fit for uh, sourcing into the future. And that's where the climate envelope for this species uh, will shift to um, if we're just considering kind of this local range. And so if we put those two side by side again, you can see that um, sourcing seed from Missouri looks like it's probably a really good fit for climate in 2050 in the Chicago wilderness area. But, and again, both our restoration location in Northern Illinois um, or you know, Southeastern Wisconsin, again, within the current historical range as well as the projected range. Um, and so again, that tells me it, that it's not a full range shift. It kind of informs my decision a little bit. Um, the species is be pollinated. Um, and so we might consider um, both a composite provenancing where we are sourcing from Missouri a little bit, or we might consider what I would what I think of as assisted migration, where we're really taking a large portion of the seeds and moving it northward kind of in advance of those changes. Um, mixing sources maybe across that whole, um, the whole range where we expect that the species is gonna move um, to increase uh, the genetic diversity and adaptation potential in our restoration. So I am guessing that many of you uh, have one really big question for me, and that is, um, would we actually use this uh, for sourcing uh, a restoration project? And the answer actually is yes, provisionally. So. Um, I work for Lake County Forest Preserve District. And up here, what you see up here is um, our standard seed sourcing um, policy. Um, when we send our, when we're looking to bid for so, some of our larger restoration projects, um, we have a two tiered preference for seed. Um, and as you can see, tier one, is a little bit further south. Everything's focused on the center of Lake County right here. Um, everything, our tier one, our most preferred source is um, actually farther to the south. So we're already kind of thinking in terms of um, climate change in all of our seed sourcing. Excuse me, I have a mad cat right now who's in my lap, so I'm just putting her down. <laughs> um, so I can continue, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and then the cat that's chasing her is also going to come across. So uh, if, if you're hearing some of this noise, I'm sorry. Um, then below, what I'd like you to see is kind of some of our provenancing, um, our, a, a, an updated map for um, climate change provenancing. Um, and you can see that we're sourcing much further to the south. I'm going to move out of the way a little bit here. Much further to the south, again, it's tier one and two. Um, this is our where we would prefer to source from. Um, and we actually are using this in uh, uh, a project in Grant Woods Forest Preserve right now. And we have two fields that are side by side using 
our currency sourcing strategy alongside of our climate adjusted provenancing strategy. We're using the same species in the same ratios and we will be following those in terms of seed germination and establishment. Um, ultimately, um, the kind of phenology, do they leaf out and do they flower at the same time? Um, we'll also be looking at pollinators to see, you know, how does that affect pollinators? We'll take genetic samples across um, those two different uh, types so that, you know, 20 years from now, when they're interbreeding, um, we can see kind of what the, um, the largest and most successful proportion of the population looks like, what that genetic signature looks like. So we're really trying to use this um, on the ground project as a, as a demonstration of this approach, um, really long term trying to understand whether it's going to work and if it works is it different for different species? So just a few um, kind of lessons about seed sourcing. Um, if you really want to be local and you're in a site that doesn't require strict local provenance, um, you could consider extending the radius of your collections as we have done in uh, Lake County. Um, we should think about deploying different strategies for different species based on their life history and especially their geographic range and mating system. Um, when you're buying seed, this is a bit of a potluck, you know, you, you may or may not get a good answer, but ask about where they, where they collected the original seed from. Where's the, and was it, you know, 10 plants or was it a hundred? Um, and then finally, you know, um, you can source from different vendors across a geographic range as much as possible um, to try and uh, get some of this um, admixture provenancing as a way of future shocking, if you will, your restorations. Um, if those provenances uh, fit your particular policy or the, uh, the needs of your particular project. Now, one thing that I would like to say is that our Grant Woods project, it is, um, it's a de novo restoration from agricultural fields and it is really isolated. And so we are not as worried about um, outbreeding depression, uh, causing outbreeding depression in the remnant prairies because there aren't any. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a, good, it's a good site, um, but also a good lesson that you know, if you have a small remnant prairie, you really might want to have a different sourcing strategy than a de novo uh, restoration project. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you, there we go. And then of course, monitoring is really important. If you do any of this type of provenancing, um, following up, trying to figure out, is this actually working? Um, is your population decreasing or not? Is it increasing? Has, has the strategy worked? All of these things are really important, even if you can just get a little bit of data um, to help you know uh, whether your strategy is working or not for the next time. So uh, Isa did um, give a, a, a little spoiler alert. Um, if you're interested in, uh, uh, um, if you're interested in attending, it's attending, um, a, a, an SDM workshop or a workshop where I show you the online tools that are really user-friendly and very approachable um, to look at some of these questions for the species that you might be interested in. Um, just go ahead and let us know. And ooh, whether you want a one day or a two half day workshop, um, I, I think a one day workshop would be useful, but very intense. Um, so, oh, look at that, two half-day workshops. Okay, that's my preference too, I, I confess. I'll be much more responsive uh, the second day than I would be the second half of one day. So um, that's terrific. Um, we will have um, more details about that following up. And again, I wanna thank um, our sponsors, et cetera. Um, and we will, 
we will be reaching out to you via email uh, in a follow-up. We'll you know, send um, surveys, et cetera, et cetera, um, as well as uh, more information uh, about this workshop, which I'm trying to do sometime in May um, after burning is over, uh, but before um, field work really starts in earnest. So I'm gonna end the polling now. A lot, got a good response from that. Um, and share the results so you guys can see it. And then uh, questions that people might have. Oh, I see some, there've been some questions and some answers in the chat, which is awesome. And then um, the other thing is that we do kind of have a survey that we've got on SurveyMonkey um, that we would love to have you um, take if you would will be willing to share, you know, eight or 10 minutes of your time after we're done here today. Um, so if there are questions, um, easily you wanna read any questions that are still kind of outstanding, if anybody or if other comments and things. I know I'm, I'm scrolling back because um, uh, there was one from Gary that I saw. If prairie bush clover is moving out of Illinois, um, why, are the more, why are the more Northern areas becoming better? Um, multiple factors impacting distribution change. Yeah, it's true. Um, the, first of all, the Southern, the Southern populations here in Illinois have always kind of been a little bit at their, the extent, the Southern extent of their ranges. Um, and the, most popular location for those plants to be found definitely is in Minnesota. Um, but even that's moving, the, it's the climate envelope that is moving um, to the north. And whether the species will be able to follow its climate or adapt in place to the climate change, that's the big question. Um, and I don't think we have a really good answer for that species yet. Um, I uh, have a long-term monitoring project um, out at uh, Nechusa Grasslands. And, um, you know, the, the population continues to go up and down. And whether that's climate or just because it's a small population, uh, I think is still an outstanding question. Um, Patty, there's a good question from Nina. Is there evidence of these seed sourcing strategies can support competitive advantage to native plants against the invasion as climate change changes? Wow, that's an awesome question. And I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, there's, I, I don't know of anybody who has actually like looked at that even as an experiment. Um, I think that the answer to that might be um, potentially yes. Uh, if we look at in particular, I think if we look at the warm season grasses, those are the species that um, really have kind of gone gangbusters in our local region as our climate is changing. Um, and so I think the, the potential is there. If it's, if it's either a species it's, that itself is able to really do well under climate change, like the C4 grasses, um, I think that we can use that as an indication that anything that is better adapted to especially late summer drought might potentially be a little bit more competitive. But I don't know of anybody who has actually looked at that experimentally, um, but that is potentially a question that we could be answering uh, in our, our Grant Woods project. If we see that, that might actually tell us some and of that. Stephanie did share the great link to an uh, article Ah, there you go. So, Thank you, Stephanie. Um, we also know there, there have been experiments showing that, especially in the timber industry, that changing the provenance makes the, um, the uh, just makes the plants more robust and their survival rate, growth, et cetera. All these things you evaluate success by are greater as climate changes and you use different provenance. Uh, what we found, like Patty said, was that in a lot of the literature, it is the trees that most of the research is concentrated on. Um, so 
um, as much as it's similar, it's different. So I guess the, the basic ecology answer to any question, it depends. And Kathy also asked a question, SDM, species distribution modeling. Sorry um, for using the acronym um, or niche modeling. That's, that's basically, or bioclimatic envelope modeling, all kind of the same thing. Um, No problem. Any other questions or comments that we can answer um, or address? Um, one thing, if you want to, uh, yes, thank you. That is exactly where I was going, Isa. What's the group email? We do have um, a, a group email and it is climate resilient seed at get my cat out of the way so I can actually, you know, finish typing this out at gmail.com. So um, if you if you want to join us um, in uh, periodic meetings or you would like follow up, you want to come to the, the workshop, um, if you want to ask other questions, uh, feel free to email there. Um, and we'll be happy to uh, continue to interact with you. The email didn't go through. Sorry, Patty, uh, I was private chatting in there. I didn't see oh. the email in the chat, pop up in the chat. Maybe you directed it. Oh, somewhere. I did. I, I direct messaged it to somebody. Sorry about that. Thank you for saying that. Climate I do that all the time. Feed at gmail.com. There. Make sure I spelled it right. Yeah, so just climate resiliency and it's a Gmail address that I is set up just, you know, so we we don't lose your email in the, the flood of email from other sources. <laughs> um, well, thanks so much everybody for um, joining us today. It really has been a pleasure to be here and um, share with you some of the things that we're working on. Um, what is this area of science called? Um, uh, it's really provenancing uh, and, and um, yeah, I mean, that's what I think of it as. And it is um, climate adaptation science. That's a good one too. Yes, that one, that works just as well. Um, it's, it is really the attempt to future shock our native populations by understanding whether or not our, our herbaceous plant species are a, a able to adapt in place or if we need to um, help that adaptation process along. So that works really well. Thanks again. Um, and again, thanks again to our sponsors and especially I have to put a shout out to the Wildlife Conservation Society for um, providing funding for our project at Grant Woods. Great, thank you. Thank you. Great job, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, 
Let's see who's still on. Okay, we've got a few still here. I will go ahead and, and uh, just get the recorded link to you and, and out. And if you want, I'll just go ahead and send it out. And if you send me the survey link directly, I'll make sure that I get that included in it and anything else that you would like me to include in the wrap up. And a big thank you to Anna and Stephanie for working the chat and answering questions and dropping links. Yeah, that was incredible. I've never seen so much content going in through a chat on any of the any of the webinars that I've done. That's amazing. You guys did a great job. Thank you. Sure thing. Great job, Patty and Isa. Thanks. Yeah. Great job, everyone. And and Laura, if you could, I don't know how we might use this, but can you save the the chat. I'm not sure whose Zoom are using. If we're using Patty's Zoom or or uh, Laura's, yeah, no, but I'll, I'll save the chat. I, I will save the chat. Okay. Great. Perfect. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. If there's any questions or any other follow up, let me know. Okay. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.